Good afternoon. The Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. Today is February 13th, 2023. We do have a quorum present, and we are going to go into our confirmation proceedings for Commissioner Bob Jacobson. So, Commissioner, come on forward, and uh, we welcome your presentation and learning more about you. And uh, whenever you are ready, go ahead and state your name and tell us more. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chair Latz, members of the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Bob Jacobson, and I was appointed by Governor Waltz to serve as the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. I appreciate the invitation to be here today and introduce myself and tell you about me, about my family, about my background, and my goals as the Commissioner of Public Safety. I am honored to have the opportunity to work with and alongside the over 2,100 employees of the Department of Public Safety. A little bit about me. I grew up in a small rural community called Rush City. My father was an educator who served 34 years for the Rush City School District, with all of those years serving as a high school principal and later as a school superintendent. In high school, I was active in uh, sports, and theater, and I eventually married my late wife, Janie, who was a classmate and my high school sweetheart. My late wife and I were married for more than 30 years, had two sons, Ryan and Kelly, and a daughter, Sarah. And we lived for several years in the Leinster, Minnesota area where I coached youth baseball and basketball, was a Boy Scout leader, served on the local athletics association as the vice president, and I also was elected to serve one two-year term as a Lindstrom City Council member. I received my law enforcement certification education in what was then named Lakewood Community College in White Bear Lake and was hired as a police officer for the city of New Brighton in 1983. I spent more than 32 years with the city of New Brighton serving in capacities from patrol officer to detective and in leadership positions until my retirement in 2016. During that career, I also earned my bachelor's degree from Bethel University. As mentioned, my late wife died in 2013. She died by suicide. And her death has been in part a catalyst for the teaching and training that I have done since then for the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association on both leadership and also perhaps more importantly, in resiliency on how to prepare for and survive traumatic incidents. I also worked at the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association to create a peer support program for use by law enforcement agencies and leaderships across the state of Minnesota. Our children have gone on to serve others. My two sons were United States Marines. They served nine tours in Iraq and Afghanistan between the two of them during the height of the war effort. My son Ryan now owns a, uh, his own small business in the trucking industry, and his wife Jennifer helps run their small hobby farm near the city of Wadena. My son Kelly is a lieutenant for the Minnesota Department of Corrections. His wife is a case manager for the Department of Corrections, and she currently works at the Oak Park Heights facility. My daughter Sarah is a physical therapist, and she now works for the Metropolitan Council. Her husband James is a building inspector, for the city of St. Paul and is also a paid on call firefighter for the city of New Brighton. I remarried in 2015 to my wife Diane and we've woven together a wonderful family and we are one family. Her sons have careers of service to others as well and my wife Diane retired after 32 years in public health at the county level with a focus on correctional health leadership. Our son Anthony has a doctorate in aerospace engineering, currently works as a research associate at the University of Minnesota. His wife Jeanette is a registered nurse and is nearly completed with her doctor of nurse practitioner and her intent is to work with refugee families. Our son John works for a private firm in information technology and he also serves as yet another paid on call firefighter for the city of Dayton. And he's married to his wife Holly who works in marketing for the Minnesota United Football Club. Go Loons. 
<laughs> Diane and I are blessed with nine grandchildren, eight, eight of whom are five years and younger. And my favorite name bestowed upon me is Papa Bob. I love those grandchildren dearly, and I have happily played Santa Claus, as you could probably imagine, for the last two years for this group of grandchildren that we have lovingly labeled as the Littles. For hobbies, my wife and I enjoy family time, live music, concerts, and travel. My personal hobby is exercise, and I am a self-proclaimed gym rat. I have completed 25 marathons, and my wife has become a regular pickleball player and loves the sport. As I mentioned, I retired as the Director of Public Safety in New Brighton in 2016 after more than 32 years of service to that community. That service included leading police, fire, and emergency management functions for my final 16 years. New Brighton prided itself on community engagement, community policing practices, and has received numerous awards and recognition for that work. They continue to do so, and I'm very proud of that legacy. Since then, I have become an epic failure at that retirement. I spent time working at the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. I served as the interim police chief in Stillwater, and I had the opportunity to serve in two interim positions with the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Each stop has had several months of retirement in between. My decision to pursue this position was not taken lightly. My wife and I have enjoyed our retirement and all the freedom and the opportunities that come with it. But in the end, my heart was still in public service. And my wife, Diane, several times has let me know that she felt that my work was not yet done. Many of my colleagues and friends have asked, why? Why would you want to do this? And to me, the best answer has been, why not? And so hopefully this adventure begins. What I hope to accomplish perhaps sounds simple and straightforward, but nothing in this business is ever simple or straightforward. I will uplift and support the women and men who serve our state and our communities in their public safety mission. And I will tirelessly and faithfully engage our partners and residents for the common goal of safe communities. In my first days serving as a DPS commissioner, I've walked the halls of the BCA DVS station. And as I do today, I started representing our employees here at our state's capital. There's a lot of ground to cover. And I'm looking forward to continuing to get to know all of the DPS divisions and our impact throughout the state. We're digging in to what, we'll take, what it will take to get our work done and to build upon an already sturdy foundation. I've already witnessed how our people have responded during emergencies, including multi-day snow emergencies to help keep our state's residents, workers, and visitors safe. I've seen how they serve, making the job look easier than it truly is. And while they've done this, they've, they have been fueled by the same passion of service that burns in me. I do want to thank my predecessor, John Harrington, for his work. I also need to recognize the impact recent events have had on our workforce and on our state. The COVID pandemic, murder of George Floyd, and the events that have followed. Working through these events was not easy for our state, yet here we are, resilient and ready to stand alongside each other, moving one Minnesota into a brighter future. So to sum it up, why I sit here before you today, to me, there is no better time to be in public service. All of us get a chance to make a difference 
and hopefully millions of lives each day. The work we do and how we go about doing it has never been more important. And because I'm well aware of that, I can sit here and say to each and every one of you with commitment and dedication, I'm excited. I am excited about the weeks and the months and the years to come. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, is there anyone uh, on the committee that wishes to inquire or make any comments about Commissioner Jacobson's uh, appointment here? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, you and I have spoken in my office. You came and introduced yourself to me. And uh, I certainly enjoyed our conversation. Um, we didn't get into a lot of details in that meeting, so I have to ask you a few questions. Um, <coughs> the role of commissioner, especially in the Department of Public Safety, is one of, I would say, tremendous influence uh, and one that basically casts a long shadow. And it covers a lot of different areas. And I would imagine the governor, as well as other officials, will be asking you your professional opinion on certain issues that we're kind of struggling with right now. So I'd like to ask you a few questions on current issues and uh, Maybe you can give us a, a little perspective on how you would give advice on certain, on certain of these. Um, the, the legislature is currently having a discussion and moving in a policy direction to legalize recreational marijuana. Um, could you tell me uh, how that's going to affect uh, law enforcement judgment? Uh, what are the difficulties involved? Uh, with that new public policy, and do you favor that direction? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lemmer, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, certainly, uh, the issue of cannabis has been uh, uh, an important topic. We've heard about certainly at the legislature and, and beforehand. My commitment as uh, Director of Public Safety in my past positions, uh, Police Chief in the City of Stillwater, has always revolved around uh, safety. Um, the public safety professions, um, and I oversaw police and fire and emergency management, um, involve uh, working with elected officials, involve working with our community, involve working with our stakeholders, all with that common goal of creating a safe community. And uh, there are a number of factors that will weigh in on uh, how to create a safe community. How do you go about ensuring that you have those communications, ensuring that you have the best plan in place? Uh, my role with the Department of Public Safety, should uh, the uh, cannabis become uh, legalized, is going to, to make sure and ensure that our community stay as safe as possible. We have spent a significant amount of time uh, discussing internally and externally with our partners, um, number one, how to keep our roadways safe. Uh, we are investing into uh, uh, certainly a, a fair amount of time and effort into ensuring that our state patrol and our law enforcement officers are prepared should, uh, should this happen to, uh, to make sure that we can enforce um, any traffic safety laws that would be impacted. Uh, we know that the use of Alcohol, the use of controlled substances, all can contribute at times to uh, issues on our, on our roadways. So number one, we wanna make sure that we're keeping communities safe. Um, and as we go through that, part of, uh, part of our role is not only just um, enforcement, but it's about education. So that there's a significant amount of time that we will spend and do spend uh, in a role of enforce or education around uh, the use of controlled substances, the use of cannabis, uh, anything else that impacts the safety of our of our residents in the state. 
Um, I will certainly, as you mentioned, serve as a policy advisor to the, to the governor on any of those issues as I have the opportunity to weigh in. Uh, but again, as I view um, the cannabis issue, uh, my work is going to be focused on how we continue to keep our people safe. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lemmer. Uh, on that issue, enforcement seems to be uh, a question that we wrestle with because of the um, lack of ability to measure impairment. And, um, you know, without that measurement, um, do you think we're going to have problems with, with uh, impaired driving? And, and how, do you, how do you enforce the law? Commissioner Jacobson. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Lummer again, um, good question. Uh, part of the training in education for law enforcement is focused on driving under the influence. That includes uh, controlled substances, that includes alcohol impairment, uh, police officers, sheriff's deputies, state patrol uh, need to be, continue to be trained on how to um, uh, conduct field sobriety testing, to conduct uh, drug um, recognition evaluation, um, to make sure and identify and prosecute those who deserve to be for driving under the influence. Uh, there is no standard measurement at this time, as you know, but we are working on uh, potential uh, field uh, testing for use of cannabis. That's only just one piece of, a, of an entire system to take a look at driving under the influence. But again, there are processes in place. Again, they're called DREs um, that have been doing this for uh, a number of years, um, arresting um, individuals who have been driving under the influence of any number of controlled substances and sometimes mul multiple controlled substances. And so the the focus for us needs to be on continued training um, for those officers that are serving us on the roadways to recognize and to test and evaluate for driving under the influence. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Senator Lemmer. Thank you. Um, law enforcement has been under a lot of scrutiny in the last few years, and the issue of qualified immunity surfaces from time to time. Um, I'm not sure if qualified immunity is, is uh, high on the list this year or not, uh, but it certainly is a question by certain law enforcement labor groups. And um, I know that it creates a difficulty because sometimes the, uh, the tried and true uh, qualified immunity pattern that we've had in the past uh, doesn't seem to have an adequate alternative right now. Um, how would you advise on the issue of qualified immunity? Commissioner Jacobson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Lemmer. Uh, qualified immunity certainly has been an issue that's come up uh, numerous times. Uh, part of my focus in coming in uh, to this position uh, has been really looking at one of the, the really huge issues, which is recruitment and retention in law enforcement. And I think that um, we, we need to be able to recruit, retain, uh, keep high quality police officers in the community. Um, I think the issue of qualified immunity may or may not have an impact on recruitment and retention. I think as part of an overall package, if, if, re if qualified immunity does become a, a, a topic or a subject of interest for the legislature, or for the governor, I'll certainly weigh in. Uh, but I, I, think, um, I think what my focus would be is to have the highest trained, highest quality uh, police officers in the country um, that we're able to work efficiently and effectively with all of our communities um, and that uh, anything uh, significant that perhaps will deter or make it more difficult for recruitment and retention that we certainly should have some uh, lively discussion on what those impacts might be. And one last question, Senator Lummer. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, there, there is a, a growing presence of undocumented uh, aliens in our nation. Um, there are some uh, political leaders who do not believe that uh, local law enforcement should report these individuals to ICE, uh, and others uh, do. And... Um, 
it's more of a political question than I think it is a policy question. <clears throat> but nevertheless, how would you advise uh, a policymaker on that issue? Should should undocumented workers be uh, recommended to uh, the federal agency of ICE? Commissioner Jacobson. Thank you, Chair Lass. Uh, Senator Lemmer, uh, it's a complicated issue, but I, I would tell you that um, the focus within the Department of Public Safety is, is, uh, is not focused as federal authorities are on immigration and immigration issues. Our focus is on making sure that we continue to keep our citizens and our community safe. Um, issues of immigration, I think, um, again, like you say, are complex and, need, and we need policy um, and political leaders to, to help um, chart that focus ahead. Um, in my experience, uh, it has been far better in, in our time to build community relationships with all Minnesotans and all people who reside here, whether they, they be um, 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 born here or whether they have not been born here. I think uh, the issue is about building community, building safe uh, neighborhoods, uh, building um, you know, communities that can, and can add to, to the safety and the safe fabric of our society. And, um, and in the, again, in my experience in working with uh, those who may be undocumented, our approach in law enforcement has been to serve them like we do anybody else in our community. No other questions. Senator Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair Latz. Uh, good to see you again, uh, Commissioner Jacobson. Uh, I, and I appreciate you bringing up the DREs, the, uh, the drug recognition evaluators. And, the, and, I, and I like the fact that you said we're gonna, you're going to focus on having highly trained officers. I think that's highly important, and I think that makes our law enforcement in the state of Minnesota stand out far above many other states in this in our union. Uh, the question I have is going down that road of DRE. I know there, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there's 197 DRE, DRE officers in the state of Minnesota covering 92 agencies. I view that as inadequate number. Uh, you tell me your thoughts and, and how you look to uh, improve on that. Commissioner Jacobson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator, uh, it's a good question on DREs. Uh, you probably have better information than I do. I could not quote you how many DREs we have that are active in the state of, uh, of Minnesota. However, I, I will tell you, I know from experience that DREs um, are available for use by any agency when they're out there and they're working. Uh, the other thing I would add is that our police officers, um, as they are, are trained and, and come up through their academies or um, you know, post-approved training, uh, we, officers are trained to identify people who are under the influence. Sometimes it, it may be difficult to, to ascertain as to whether or not they're under the influence of a controlled substance such as cannabis or whether it be alcohol or whether it be multiple uh, other uh, drugs or controlled substances. But our officers, even though they may not be specifically trained DREs, are trained to conduct um, field sobriety testing. They are uh, trained to, uh, um, to pursue other chemical testing means uh, if it's available. And so I think we are we are prepared uh, to address this, but we're never as prepared as we want to be. So the other piece of that is, to, again, to continue to um, encourage more officers, more sheriff's deputies to become DRE trained. Um, I, think, I think that's going to be an important next step, especially as we perhaps um, uh, look at uh, community safety and, and safety on our roadways. And so um, I, I, there'll probably never be enough officers to, uh, to be DREs that would make us comfortable, but I think we can continue to enhance the training that we have uh, and hopefully uh, recruit and train more DREs in our communities. Senator Howe. Thank you, Chair Latz, and I appreciate that, that, uh, that response. I guess my concern is, is as you said, they're, they're available to anyone at any time, and I think that's actually a hurdle for us to actually get more folks to 
asked to uh, to go to that training because then they're more apt to get called out when they're probably on their time off when nobody wants to get up at two three in the morning because that's usually what the, the time frame and when they need them. So I, I guess that I see that as a big hurdle as we go forward, and it's probably why we have so few. But I appreciate your your comments, and and if you've got a uh, a future solution to that uh, that hurdle, I would I would love to hear it. So thank you, Senator Hall. Certainly, uh, um, certainly there's the specialized training that's helpful, um, and a lot of the state patrol um, are already trained. I don't know what the percentage is, but they're they're readily available in, in a lot of uh, cases. But regular field sobriety tests often show signs of impairment, not only from alcohol but also from controlled substances and so on, and, and uh, that's often plenty of probable cause for an officer to request, say, a urine test or a blood test instead of a breath test, which the fluid test will show uh, controlled substances. Uh, uh, I, well. I agree with you, Chair Latz, but I, again, we don't know at what level that when we were talking cannabis, at what level of, of that it affects anyone. So without that information, I don't know forever, you know, the cannabis question is the biggest question that's out there. And I believe that's why the DREs are further along trained and, and actually have a better understanding of how, the, how to identify that. So that's why I focused on the DREs, because even when you do those types of samples, we don't have the status, of, we don't have the blood level or anything else that tells us when someone's impaired like we do with the alcohol piece. So that's, that's why I, I focus on the DREs. Thank you, and Senator Howell, this might surprise you, but I actually agree with you. <laughs> um, we should have more DREs trained out there. Um, but one thing that the, the fluid tests will show is whether or not um, there's the, the, uh, the, active, the psychoactive ingredient, the THC, is present in its original form, uh, still in a person's uh, uh, blood, um, as opposed to the, the uh, metabolite, which lingers for 30 or more, can linger for 30 or more days and isn't actively impairing the individual at the time that the test is taken. And so I've seen plenty of prosecutors differentiate between how they approach these cases. You know, uh, charges of DWI, cannabis related. Um, if there's an active THC that's in the fluid sample, they'll, they'll be less, much less flexible in how they will handle a case than if it's the metabolite, uh, which you know, may have been ingested 25 days earlier and not have any present impact on signs of impairment that are observed at a scene. But I, I agree with you, and, and we all ought to be working to increase the number of DREs in the state for, for a variety of reasons. It's, and it's not just cannabis. There's a lot of other chemicals, controlled substances out there that are being increased in use and are uh, problematic. And that's regardless of whether cannabis ends up being legalized in Minnesota or not. Senator Howe. Thank you, Chair Latz. And I guess having been a, uh, a fire marshal that gets, got called up at every hour of the day to go look at bad stuff, uh, I understand the reason why I got out of doing fire investigations <laughs> Because it's not, and, and I'm sure that that's a hurdle to be a DRE because uh, you get called out at all times of the day. So I think there's a huge uh, other factor that, that hinders folks from uh, signing up to be a DRE. I'm glad we can work together on this, Senator Howe. Any other comments from members of the committee or questions? Senator Umu Verbate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the Committee on Judiciary recommend that the appointment of Bob Jacobson as the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety be confirmed. Not seeing any further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Congratulations, Commissioner. This will now go to the Senate floor. Thank you. And then members, we're now going to move into a PowerPoint presentation from the Department of Public Safety. This will be both a policy and budget overview as we prepare uh, for the other main portion of our work this session, which is coming up with some money for the ongoing operations of the Department of Public Safety, at least our portion of it. Members of the public who are watching will also understand that the uh, Transportation Committee also funds a substantial portion of this department, so we have categories are divided between the two Senate committees in this area. 
So why don't uh, Commissioner or uh, your staff, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, begin your presentation for the uh, department. Uh, hello, Chair Last, members of the committee. Glad to be back in front of you again. Um, for the record, my name is Bob Jacobson. I am the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, thank you for having DPS here today to discuss our budget requests for the Public Safety Divisions. I will present the agency-wide proposal and then we will have our division directors come up and present their items in more detail and we will all be available for questions at the end. And our first slide uh, is it's, uh, funding to maintain current service levels. Um, as with uh, all businesses, government agencies, we're seeing an increase in the costs associated with our current work. Factors such as inflation and IT costs. Uh, this operating adjustment, uh, adjustment would allow our division to maintain our current level of service. This covers the BCA, uh, OJP, State Fire Marshal's Office, Homeland Security, Emergency Communications Networks, and our support divisions. For DPS administration, uh, while divisions like BCA and OJP and others are public facing and get more attention, DPS does have multiple internal support divisions that support all of their work. Those such as human resources, communications, fiscal and administrative services, tribal and government relations, they are all critical to the work and the mission of the Department of Public Safety. Without funding for these support divisions, other divisions could not properly function. We're also looking for additional funding for community engagement. That is deeply critical and necessary for all of the work that the Department of Public Safety does. Specifically, we aim to grow our capacity to engage in authentic and meaningful community engagement around DPS initiatives, training, and opportunities. We want to be able to best serve the public and do what we need to do to engage with communities from around the state. We're also looking to invest in body-worn cameras. We believe that all peace officers in the state should have body-worn cameras. Uh, these grants would help accomplish that goal, and it really is an important step in building uh, community trust. We're also looking at a first responder wellness office. Uh, first responders who routinely respond to traumatic incidents face an increased risk of experiencing behavioral health issues, including mental illness and substance abuse disorders and we want to hire experts on staff to provide statewide leadership and resources to local agencies. We also have a firearm safety package that includes uh, criminal background checks, extreme risk protection orders, the minimum age to purchase uh, military style assault weapons, um, prohibitions on large capacity magazine sales, and um, a safe storage uh, provision. And none of these proposals we know will solve violence by itself, but each proposal can be helpful. Uh, we're also looking at implementing a DPS strategy and analytics team. Uh, that funding would establish a centralized strategy and analytics team that serves as a resource to um, our leadership in areas that include strategy, analytics, evaluation, and performance management. We know that creating evidence-based approaches require the proper approach, review, and investment. We're also looking at moving soft body armor to the public safety budget. Uh, that program uh, it will better align. And again, this means uh, helping to expand the soft body armor program to incl include fire and EMS uh, professionals. We're also asking to expand the line of duty death. Uh, expansion would cover cancer link to firefighting, would expand to cover suicide link to PTSD or a recent traumatic event. Uh, just a note, this request includes funding in the current fiscal year as our account is currently out of funding. Also, a uh, couple more items. Uh, looking for authority to accept grant funds. Uh, this would allow DPS to continue the mission of serving all communities to build a safe for Minnesota. And we would, of course, report on the grants to this committee. We also have a proposal regarding body camera footage uh, release. This policy would require law enforcement to release body and dash cam footage in five days for families and 14 days to the public and media. Uh, law enforcement could, of course, delay if releasing the footage would harm that investigation. Good afternoon. Uh, oh, is this? Yeah. 
Good afternoon. My name is Kate Weeks. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Justice Programs here with the Department of Public Safety. Thank you for having us here today to learn more about the governor's proposal. In the governor's budget, uh, we are asking for additional funding for crime victim prevention funding. This is a current grant program that we operate through the Office of Justice Programs. What we consistently see over the years is we get uh, an incredible amount of um, request for the money more than we have available. So we're asking for additional investment in this area. This is one of our more uh, robust and um, flexible grant programs to address community crime prevention in communities throughout the state. Uh, previous things that have been funded with this money include probation programs, truancy programs, elder abuse prevention, neighborhood watch programs, resident engagement, community and faith-based projects. Ideally, this program is developed so communities know what they need when it comes to community crime prevention, and it's a very robust program. Uh, we are also asking for an additional, inv uh, an additional investment in the Office of Justice program to establish a missing and murdered African American women task force. Uh, the Missing and Murdered African American Women Task Force released a report to the legislature in December 2022. One of those recommendations was to invest in an ongoing office to address the issue of missing and murdered black women and girls throughout the state. Uh, this investment would fund approximately six staff people to work on everything identified in the report, which is very robust. Um, and it would also provide training and education, outreach, data collection, research and analysis, evaluation, reporting, and providing grants to um, community serving black women and girls. In addition, we are also asking for an additional investment in the Department of Public Safety Office of Justice Programs for staff. This investment would increase our ability to provide research reporting and evaluation, increase our ability for grant management and financial compliance and monitoring, um, an additional resource uh, staff person to, uh, for reparations claims, for crime victim justice unit investigations, and in ensures that communities across the state know what services are available to them and how to access them. The next investment we are looking at is in our Youth Justice Office. Two years ago, the legislature appropriated money to stand up a Youth Justice Office within the Office of Justice Programs. This office currently is working on compliance um, and grant managing Title II funds that come from the federal government related to juvenile justice initiatives. We are asking for additional funds for a data specialist to help track um, patterns and uh, data and analysis on juvenile justice and reduce, reducing ethnic and racial disparities in the juvenile justice system. In addition, we are asking for grant funds through this office to increase the money available for our youth intervention program uh, to start an ongoing, it's called a statewide crossover dual status youth programming. A pilot was run through the Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee a number of years ago that really proved successful in providing specific resources for juveniles who are touching the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system. In addition, uh, there would be additional funding for disp disparities reduction and delinquency prevention. Currently, we only use federal funds for these grant programs, and we're looking to, and those funds have decreased 85% since 2002. So an additional investment would help uh, fund those programs throughout the state. In addition, the Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee has several youth who are involved in the criminal justice system serving on that panel. And what they asked to do was to travel throughout the state, meeting with youth to see what other services and supports could we be providing youth throughout, the, throughout Minnesota. And they came up with three ideas, which we also agree with. One is they are asking for more money, so we're asking for additional grants for youth mental health and youth chemical dependency supports for youth in the juvenile justice system. We're asking for additional resources to grant out to communities who have lost juvenile justice residential facilities to provide pro programming in those communities so that youth are not taken away from their support systems within their home communities. We're also asking for an investment in grants related to gang prevention. And that could look a number of different ways. We have seen an increase in violence, uh, particularly in communities related to gang violence. And so additional resources are being asked for for anti-gang activity and, and 
investment. Next slide. Oh, it's already on there. Okay. We are uh, Ms. Also, Weeks, I do have a question for you yes. on that. When we get the uh, the formal detailed budget proposal, or maybe we already have it, are, are these different categories broken out in that more detailed proposal? Obviously, it's not in as much detail in the PowerPoint. Yes, there is additional detail in the change items that were included in the governor's budget that came out, and I'm more than happy to provide additional information to the committee. Absolutely. And, and that information will be available to all of the committee members, so mm -hmm. thank you. Go ahead. Uh, two years ago, um, the legislature invested in establishing a missing and murdered indigenous relative office. We hired Director Rudy last year, and we're onboarding three additional staff uh, currently. One of the things that when we set up the office and asked for this investment that we didn't fully understand is the incredible need that Director Rudy has been um, receiving and handling from families and those most impacted by this who are either have missing and murdered um, indigenous relatives. And so she's been work working very closely with families over the past nine months in figuring out uh, resources available and helping to answer questions about their cases. And this has led to an additional request for a case manager and a victim specialist to help in this work for the office. In addition, uh, the office would like to stand up an advisory group to help guide the work of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relative Office, and we're asking for resources to support those family members and advocates who step forward uh, to help with that work. One of the main things that we have heard from our stakeholders and our grantees throughout the state is a need for additional investment in housing for crime victim services and those ex trying or fleeing violent situations. So we were asking for an additional investment for a, it's called a domestic violence housing first initiative. So that is providing additional resources for emergency housing for people who need safe shelter and also providing mobile advocacy uh, for our grantees and domestic violence serving programs. One one of the things we found in the pandemic, it is very hard sometimes to seek services, especially in greater Minnesota. And so this would provide additional staff and resources for that. We are also asking uh, to stand up in Minnesota domestic violence and sexual violence specific transitional housing. One of the things we hear is that shelters are full. One of the reasons is an increase in need, but it is also there is nowhere for someone to go. And so this would pr be providing transitional housing resources throughout the state for individuals trying to leave shelter, but not quite ready for permanent housing. And, this, and the reason why it's specific to domestic violence is that there's a lot of services and resources specific for victims of crime trying to get back on their feet. We are also asking, and as, as we've seen over the past couple of years, an increase in violence. So we're, so we're asking it for an additional increase in um, resources available for victims of violence who are not specific to DV or sexual assault or child abuse. And so that could be in the form of direct client assistance uh, through corner cornerstone, so like if your car was uh, stolen and ended up getting towed and in the impound lot, it helps pay for fees to get your car out because your car is there for no reason, uh, for not, your, not because of you. All right. <laughs> and then uh, we are also asking, uh, similar to every state in the nation, all states are facing a decline in uh, federal funding for crime victim services. FOCA funding is our primary source of funding for crime victim services in the state of Minnesota and we are facing a reduction due to uh, reduced funds in the crime victim fund at the federal level. Without this funding, our crime victim services throughout the state are facing about uh, the equivalent of 100 lost um, advocacy jobs. So this is an important investment to keep those services. And we also have several policy pieces I'll run through quickly. One is we'll be updating, uh, we're asking for updates to the Crime Victim Reparations Program, which includes a, a change for the name of the program to better reflect what it is, which is a reimbursement program. We're also asking for some changes to ensure that it easier access to the program. And then we will also be bringing forward um, technical updates um, to better align with when our crime victim services move from the Department of Corrections over to OJP, and then streamlining crime victim notification requirements. Ms. Weeks, um, on the, uh, back on your previous comment about the uh, federal victims of crime mm -hmm. funding gap, can you explain a little bit more what you meant by the loss of 100 victim advocacy 
jobs around the state. Yep. So, oh, Chair Latz, members, uh, with that reduction in federal funds, it is um, approximately 80% of the funding that goes out for crime victim services in the state. So an $8 million reduction per year is the equivalent of, um, and that would be $16 million over a two-year period. That's a significant number of um, advocacy positions potentially, and that is the primary funding source that services are using to support victims of crime. It's people. Um, the nonprofit organizations and community organizations serving victims is people. And so that is the equivalent throughout the state. So Ms. Weeks, are you saying organizations like Cornerstone and, and others that have victim advocates in the courtrooms, for example, it's not the only place they do their work, obviously, but it's part of where they do their work. Are those folks funded this through this program? Is, is that what you're saying? Yes, um, VOCA does probably most likely funds those positions. And what we're, uh, OJP will be releasing the next competitive grant process for crime victim services at the end of the month. And so our crime victim service providers understand that this federal funding um, that we will be receiving less. And so they are trying to put together their budgets and applications at this time um, with that understanding that that hole exists. And they are putting, to, we're still asking that community organizations apply for what they need, um, but we will only be able to grant out what we have. Thank you. Marshall Smith, welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jim Smith, and I serve as a state fire marshal. In our first proposal, we have firefighter training and education, and what we are recommending is uh, an increase of funding through the general fund uh, going to the Minnesota Board of Firefighter Training and Education. This funding would go directly to the fire departments within Minnesota. We have 750 fire departments and 20,000 firefighters. Many of those outstate fire departments rely heavily on the reimbursement program we have in order for them to do the required fire and EMS training. This additional funding would be a great benefit to those departments. Fire Marshal Division is also recommending that uh, the fire surcharge, which currently is in statute at 0.5% of the fire premiums, revert back to the 2006 legislatively appointed 0.65%, an increase of 0.15%. This would increase the fire safety account by, in today's dollars, about $5.1 million, which uh, half of that would go to the State Fire Marshal Division uh, with an effort to increase the staffing. The State Fire Marshal Division has remained at 62 employees since 1996. However, the demands from the fire departments, our state partners, uh, legislative mandates have increased dramatically. So the additional money that would go into the fire safety account, half of it would uh, benefit the staffing of the state fire marshal division. The remainder of that amount would be uh, basically targeted for the fire service of Minnesota. That would also include uh, our state response teams. Our state response teams are not actually employees of the state of Minnesota. They are teams embedded in fire departments and police departments throughout the state. Their emergency response, their training, and their equipment is uh, reimbursed through funding from the state fire marshal division. So you'll see the last item, the state hazardous response teams and bomb squads, we are asking for an increase in funding to help offset those costs for uh, emergency and non-emergency response uh, for these teams. On the policy side, uh, we have language that we are asking for our state assets. The state assets, again, 
include our 11 hazardous material teams. We have two urban search and rescue teams, one basically in the metro, and we've just started another one up in the Duluth area. And we have four bomb disposal units and one air wing rescue team. We have redone the language to incorporate all of those teams in existing statute. This would uh, make it much easier for us to reimburse all teams as opposed to just the hazardous material teams because all the teams working uh, or contracted by the state of Minnesota uh, are reimbursed through the state. This language would, would make that a lot easier. The next one, the smoke detectors. The Minnesota State Fire Code has two separate and distinct definitions of smoke detectors and smoke alarms. In order to align with the Minnesota State Fire Code, we are recommending that the changes from smoke detector to smoke alarm be implemented. And that is just, again, like I say, to align with the current Minnesota State Fire Code. And finally, the fire investigations policy. In 2022, we developed a ad hoc committee of members from private and public fire investigation teams. This was a subset of the Minnesota chapter of the International Association of Arson Investigators. They looked at our 299F policies and have re uh, worded a lot of the policy to clarify who is the authority having jurisdiction and specific procedures uh, on the fire ground that will be followed not only by the state fire investigation team, but also public and private from smaller municipalities or whatever. I stand for any questions. Are there any questions? Not seeing any, thank you. Director Reed. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Reed, the Interim Director for the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And I have three items that I'd like to briefly talk about. First is a disaster contingency account. We're asking for our annual, our biannual in, uh, refill of that account. Currently, 92% of that account goes to out greater Minnesota for reimbursement for disasters that happen. And disasters that are Federally declared, we, we cover the non-federal share, which is 25% of that total, and then in gubernatorial disaster declarations, which we would cover 75% and the locals cover 25. So we would like to have that done. At this point, we have about, with the current disasters, the latest being the one from 12, December 12th through 16th, we have about a million dollars left in that account. So looking at head into the spring, it would be a challenge and uh, we would really need to bolster that account. Secondly, as you know, may, school- May I yes, ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. um, how much do you anticipate using each year? If, Senator Lats, if Mother Nature helps us, uh, that is a little bit of a, usually it's around 30, 25 to $30 million per year. Um, okay. Last year was an exceptional year uh, that put us about 62 million totally, so about 30 some million from the state share. But depending on how disasters work out, there is some carryover, some put back. So when we see a disaster, we hold some and then we can put back into that account. So usually it's at 25 to 30, but this 40 would be about what we estimate we would need over the next two years based on where we are. Okay. That's my other clarifying point because your note here says uh, uh, 40 million for FY24. Um, is that FY24 and 25 then, or is that a, is this a two year request yeah. for 40 million? Mr. Chair, uh, my name is Jordan Hall Dr. Hyde, Director of Legislative Affairs for DPS. Uh, the $40 million is a one time request, so it's not ongoing in 25. Okay, so are you anticipating then? <laughs> Uh, depending on the status of the account coming back uh, for a, an interim appropriation, if, if that becomes necessary after the first year? Mr. Chair, the money, the funds carry forward into uh, fiscal year 25. All right, thank you. Our second request is 
as you've all noticed, that Director things Smith. are continuing to happen in our schools. And our current school safety center of our five staff, we're looking at adding two additional that would help support in the preparedness and recovery of any particular event. Uh, to add two staff for that, for all schools, public, private, parochial, and tribal schools in the state of Minnesota, focused on K through 12. Our third request is to help us help our customers, partially because of increased funding, mostly in the cyber and nonprofit world. We need to add a grants a grants person to help that, and those are almost 100% pass through grants to the local jurisdictions or nonprofit agencies. Along with that, our increased training. As emergency management has changed over the years, it used to be we would train just mostly county level emergency managers or cities or tribal, but because of the way it's changed, private sector, uh, school systems, and others are now having a higher demand on our, on our need for training, so we need to add at least one person there. So the total is to add four staff to better serve those who we need to serve. And I will stand for questions. Any questions? Thank you. Director Walden. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dana Wahlberg. I'm the director of the Emergency Communication Networks Division. We oversee four core programs there, one of which is 911 that I'm here to talk about specifically today. Uh, we have two recommendations, one for a modernization of the 403 911 statute to represent the next generation 911 environment that Minnesota has been transitioning to now for more than 10 years. <clears throat> During this time, portions of both the old and the new network have coexisted, and we are preparing to really sunset the remainder of the old network now, which is necessitating statute changes consistent with being able to accommodate the technologies and operationalization of the next generation 911 operating environment. And consistent with that, um, because of the technology changes in the network, we are also going to be experiencing significant increased costs um, for all of our 911 centers across the state. There are 103 911 call centers or public safety answering points or PSAPs as we call them. Uh, we're recommending a one-time funding of $7 million from the 911 Special Revenue Fund. Uh, two eligible PSAPs to be distributed in accordance with the formula that is currently described today within 403.112 subdivision two. And we're looking to have that paid out in September 2023 to be available to them for expenditures over a two year period. And that would be specifically to help cover the cost of new equipment, technology upgrades, and the associated training required to interface with the new network that DPS is implementing statewide. This is a requirement that's consistent not only with federal expectations for next generation 911 deployment, but also to meet the requests from the public who expect to be able to use their cell phones or their smartphones to be able to communicate with 911 similarly to the way that they do with their family and friends today. And with that, I will stand for any questions. Yeah, Director Wahlberg, this has been a 10 year transition. Once uh, the new generation 911 is fully implemented, how long do you think that will last until we'll need to transition to the <laughs> next round? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, that's a very good question. I guess to put it into perspective, uh, 25 or 30 years ago when we started taking wireless calls, we said that this will never catch on and that wireless technology will never really consume our time. Today, 86% of our calls are coming from wireless phones, and in 2017, we implemented text to 911, and currently 1% of our, our uh, requests to 911 are currently coming from text, or from, from text to 911 uh, requests. 1% you said? 1% today. Senator Pappas. 
Um, how do you text 911? I just want to know. <laughs> uh, you just go up into the field, the two field on your phone, and, and type the digits 911, and then go down into the message field just oh, as though it? you were sending it to someone else. Oh, and well, wonders never see. <laughs> what is the uh, GPS location capability then once that's done? If someone, all they can do is text the 911, but they aren't able to text uh, an address or anything like that, or they're not sure what their address is. Actually, uh, Mr. Chair Director and members Walker. of the committee, with the implementation of a Next Generation's core services platform, which is a platform that we have already gone out to RFP to solicit, um, there will be the opportunity for a geospatial coordinate of the handset to come right with the 911 call and to plot on the map within the 911 call center so the dispatcher has a precise location of where that handset is, which will be a tremendous enhancement for providing improved location accuracy with a 911 call. Thank you. Any questions from members? Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Superintendent Evans. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Drew Evans. I am the superintendent of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And thank you for taking the time to um, allow us the opportunity to present on the governor's budget recommendations. I will go over the ones uh, pertaining to the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and provide any questions that you may have about this. The first one is creating ongoing funding for our force investigations unit. If you recall, you funded this unit that was a effort um, that came out of our Deadly Force Encounters Working Group and an examination of how we conduct investigations and the use of force investigations across the state of Minnesota. That unit has been formed, it's up and running, it currently investigates at the request of local agencies, use of force incidents, officer involved shootings, criminal sexual conduct investigations related to law enforcement um, that is required by law and M Minnesota National Guard cases that involve a Minnesota National Guard member uh, that is a suspect in the case and a Minnesota National Guard member that is the victim survivor uh, in those cases as well. The funding for this unit ends at the end of this year and without the funding for this unit ongoing, we would not be able to continue with these activities. The second item is our violent crime reduction uh, supports, uh, violent crime reduction support initiative. And this is a strategy and works with the teams that we've been examining that has threefold pieces. Since April of this year, we've been providing assistance to Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, and our surrounding Twin Cities communities uh, addressing the increase in violent crime. We have a team that's been doing that work but is not sustainable with ongoing funding. We've had 12 agents that are dedicated to that and they've been effective in working with both our state and local partners with this, and this strategy would be one component of that. The strategy would employ three main parts. One is a, a forensic approach in re-examining how we take evidence into our laboratory to do a front-end processing technique to provide leads in investigations in a manner that's more quick than we do it now to speed the examination of evidence through our laboratories to provide forensic analysis more quickly to give agents, investigators in the field uh, answers to further investigations. The second component of this would be an analytical approach. We want to take a strategic approach when it comes to violent crime and mass violence and more broadly is how we think about this. So threats to our schools, threats to our faith-based institutions, threats that are violent crime that we're seeing out on the street every day to prevent and mitigate violence and then be specific about how we're identifying those that are committing the most harm in our community. The third component of this violent reduction support initiative would be a team composed of BCA special agents and then local agencies that that we would fund and we would fund their entire salaries so those agencies could backfill behind that individual to provide further support as a statewide resource and this team would then operate across the state of Minnesota wherever they encounter issues related to both violent crime would be one component of this, those that are committing shootings, homicides, trafficking guns into our communities. And then the second component would be a team focused on carjackings and auto thefts which we've seen a significant increase of as well both across the Twin Cities metropolitan area and the state of Minnesota. The next item on this uh, list that the governor recommends is funding additional resources into the BCA Forensic Laboratory to do evidence examination. 
due to the increases that we've seen in violent crime and other increases um, of submissions to our laboratory, we've seen a 30% increase in violent crime cases submitted to our BCA forensic laboratories uh, located in St. Paul and Bemidji, uh, Minnesota. This would fund uh, additional scientists and staff to be able to get that turnaround time down to a much more acceptable level. I think in front of your committee, we've already had discussions on this topic and laboratories such as our DNA lab right now are experiencing significant uh, turnaround times. These in, this investment would provide the resources necessary to get to a target turnaround time goal of 30 days once fully implemented through the hiring and uh, uh, training process for those scientists. The next item on the list is a uh, investment in our MINGIS or Minnesota Justice Information Services Division within the BCA. This uh, would provide a couple different things. One is uh, investments to further our compliance with FBI security requirements, our own security requirements at the state level, and to do additional auditing on those systems to ensure appropriate compliance with both the security procedures and policies that are in place, but also to ensure that the systems are being used appropriately. We have seen, as many other state agencies and others, a significant increases in the amount of unwanted traffic on our systems, and we have an increased focus right now on cybersecurity to ensure that very sensitive data, which is some of the most sensitive data we hold as a state, that no nefarious actors gain uh, access to that. And so we, we are asking for additional funds to detect and mitigate any intrusions into our systems. The second piece of this that's not as clearly called out is to upgrade and um, um, and to replace the infrastructure for our e-charging system. Our e-charging in Minnesota is really the envy of many different systems across the United States that largely all of our filing is done electronically when we're filing criminal complaints and everything from citations to the actual criminal complaints to juvenile petitions that we're bringing online. But yet that system is already at the point where it's time to start uh, replacing components of that to ensure that it has the operating capacity that is necessary for that ongoing and into the future. The next one is our human uh, trafficking. Superintendent, uh, sorry, Jack, sorry to interrupt ahead. you. Um, uh, how much of that do you think could be done with one-time money as opposed to ongoing money? Chair Latz, members of the committee, as you can see on the slide here, that 9.9 .9, uh, million, if you just simply subtract out the 5.1 million ongoing, that's the one-time cost for the uh, infrastructure upgrades for that. That would be the amount that would be covered in one-time costs. The 5.1 ongoing is additional staff, maintenance agreements, ongoing maintenance for the systems. So you're saying that um, <clears throat> the FY24 number uh, Ongoing portion of it would be 5.1 million, and the rest of it, the remaining 4.8 million, would be one time or could be one time money. Chair Latz, members, that's accurate, correct? Thank you, Superintendent. Go ahead. Uh, the next item uh, that the governor recommends funding is uh, working on our human trafficking response. We operate the Minnesota Human Trafficking Investigators Task Force out of the BCA that's comprised of a multi-jurisdictional group of individuals from the St. Paul, Minneapolis Police Departments, Anoka County Sheriff's Office, Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, Ramsey County Attorney's Office to focus on human trafficking across the state of Minnesota. That task force has been largely reliant on BCA um, reallocating resources and then reliant upon funds from the office of Justice programs to fund sex trafficking out of a sex trafficking grant program that we have um, uh, funding for the state of Minnesota. Those funds are not adequate to um, be able to do this and all the different um, requirements and demands on that grant program. And so this would move that task force out of those uh, funds and would fund this uh, work permanently out of the BCA in that team model which would also free up additional funds for local uh, task forces across Minnesota, of which there's been greater demand for those funds than have been able to meet. And it would fund additional resources to do twofold. One, we've been primarily focused on sex trafficking and been limited in our ability to address labor trafficking, which is a current and growing concern um, that we have across the state of Minnesota. And so this would allow that team really to focus both on sex trafficking, labor trafficking, provide the appropriate resources that we need to really be effective to be doing operations on an ongoing basis. Superintendent, on, on that point, we're going to be hearing a labor trafficking bill la later, and I don't know if you'll be around to answer questions for that as well, but um, uh, uh, to that point, uh, 
Can you help me understand what differentiates labor trafficking from, say, other crimes, murder, uh, you know, assault, those kind of things that we have current statutes in, why would we need a separate statute for labor trafficking or a separate focus within your agency to investigate labor trafficking? Chair Latz, members of the committee, thank you for the question. Certainly can get into the underlying policy discussion on the bill um, as to the exact on the statute. In terms of the focus, these are incredibly complex cases. They're often multi-jurisdictional in nature, almost always multi-jurisdictional in nature, and they're often um, investigated in, in terms of much closer to like a, 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 a RICO type investigation where there's multiple individuals that are involved uh, with the particular case and the nature of the relationship relationship between the trafficker and the trafficked individual creates some very strong challenges when it comes to that taking a very victim-centric approach to that investigation. And sure, we're meeting the needs of the person uh, that's been trafficked in this particular situation and focusing on the trafficker that's often uh, involved in multiple types of different crimes uh, across the state. And there's also different variations when it comes to labor trafficking. There might be wage theft involved. There might be unemployment fraud involved in the particular cases or workers' compensation uh, fraud involved uh, in the particular case that we're looking at, in addition to the actual crimes that we're seeing in terms of labor trafficking and sex trafficking. As we've gotten involved in this work, we found that the underlying investigative process is very similar between sex trafficking and labor trafficking, even though they're very different crimes. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, moving on, uh, Chair Latz, uh, continue the, the very quickly on these last couple of points. Uh, the governor recommends funding uh, of one position uh, at the BCA that would focus on accreditation for all of our operations. We've had conversations with you. We believe strongly in accreditation, and our laboratory is proudly accredited um, and has been for a number of years. This would uh, accredit our law enforcement functions within the BCA, and the goal of this is to continue to raise our standards and, and approach uh, to ensuring the highest quality services and that we're operating within our policies, procedures, and practices ongoing as we operate a statewide organization. And then the last item on the list is funding a state uh, fraud unit that would focus uh, in, in, on criminal investigations of programs involving uh, re fraud related to the state of Minnesota. As you appropriate money in the various programs um, as a legislature, this would provide a unit and provide additional resources so that when criminal fraud is committed against the state of Minnesota, there would be resources available to investigate that to ensure that we're holding individuals accountable who wish to prey upon the goodwill of Minnesotans. And quickly on the policy proposals, um, the first one is uh, ratifying our question identity process um, that we have in place at the BCA to put it in statute so it's very clear to Minnesotans how to address this when somebody uses their identity. The second one is CJDN uh, use modifications and advisory board. What this would do is it would provide additional uh, responsibilities to a board that's currently in place at the BCA. Again, to bring greater transparency, they would review reports, audits, different things that we do at the BCA uh, to provide input and advice moving forward uh, in, in with a, a broad stakeholder engagement group on that. The next would be computer theft. This comes from a case that we worked to make sure that uh, in the current environment, those nefarious actors that wish to intrude into some of our governmental and other uh, systems, that if they had not actually utilized um, the information they stole uh, for monetary gain, that they would still be held accountable under the policy. And the last one is POR, POR verification process. This would be a modification that we think is a unintended consequence of our laws to be able to address registrants who move out of state um, to provide a, a variety of ways that they can confirm their new residency and really clarify that under the law. And with that, I will turn it back over to Commissioner Jacobson unless there's questions. Thank you. Any questions for Superintendent Evans before we move on? Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I got one question when it comes to the the idea of getting that uh, that evidence turn around to 30 days uh, or less with the increase there, my question would come if you have the violent crime reduction strategy, isn't that going to put more stress on the same process that you're trying to, and I see that those are conflicting 
ends, if we've, is this going to be enough to get it, even with that <coughs> increase in submission rate that I, I would hope that we all hope for if we put the money into that other, into the violent crime reduction strategy? So I would assume that our, the rates, the submission rate would go up. And so I, I guess, how, do you, how, how are we going to address that, I guess, is my question. Superintendent Evans. Uh, Chair Latz and Senator Hall, thank you for the question. It's an excellent question. The Violent Crime Reduction Support Initiative includes forensic resources as well and was contemplated as part of that overall strategy. I would also note that there, the teams that are doing this work also um, you know, are working with those local agencies and, and we hope to provide better clearance rates as part of this strategy that we're going on, clearing out some of those cases which will also reduce the number of new cases going on. And the goal is to be successful with that team so that we reduce the level of violent crime that's being um, committed in some of our communities uh, through the, the work and working in partnership, but we did contemplate that, and that is both in the violent crime reduction strategy and then in the 30-day turnaround time, we did contemplate out the what we were looking at for the, the uh, submissions into our laboratories. Thank you. Final remarks, Commissioner Jacobson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Just a couple of other policy items to, uh, to bring up. Um, these are items that really are between the Transportation and Public Safety Committees. So one is an out-of-state search warrant, technical correction. This change will make it so that any driver who's determined to have been impaired at the time of a crash is subject to the same sanctions, even if they are brought to a hospital outside of Minnesota. Currently, that is not the case. Um, the Minnesota Utility Operator reporting, just to bring into line the state civil penalty that uh, amount to federal amounts. Uh, and then for DVS safety uh, recommendation to make it a specific crime to threaten or obstruct a DVS employee engaged in the performance of their official duties. And with that, uh, we will stand for any additional questions. Any final questions from members of the committee before we move on to our Senate file that's before us today? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was listening carefully, and um, lately the Office of Legislative, uh, the Office of Legislative Auditor, did a report on the oversight oversight of state funded grants to nonprofit organizations. And of course, the OJP program is one that does exactly that. Uh, the uh, department uh, was a little bit of focus of their review. I'm kind of surprised that we didn't have any comments about their review in the presentation today. And um, I had a few questions on that. This may not be the absolute place and time to do that, but I'm hoping that there would be a time to ask some of these questions but uh, has the department uh, read the report and do they have a brief overall uh, comment about it? Um, Senator Limmer, I, I agree we should certainly get a response. I want to make sure we have enough time to deal with right. the, the bill we have on the agenda today without holding people too late. So, um, Commissioner, you got about 30 seconds and then we're going to move on. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lemmer. Uh, we certainly have had a chance to review that report. I know that we have had meetings with the Legislative Auditor's Office. Um, I think uh, there were some things that obviously were pointed out in that report where uh, we can do better. And part of our legislative package is certainly to increase staffing to make sure that we're uh, oversight of grants, uh, including within the Office of Justice Programs, continues to, to do better. Uh, I think the findings also um, were uh, positive in some ways about how we were handling office adjusted programs and grant um, assistance. But again, we always know that we can do better and that would that is going to be our approach. Mr. Chairman, uh, I know that um, uh, funding of nonprofit grants and the compliance of those uh, have become a very uh, keen focus, uh, not only by auditors, but also by news agencies and uh, we wouldn't want to uh, create a new budget without uh, visiting that area. Uh, so I know we have uh, limited time today. This is just an overview of your proposals. And then we also have the other areas in our budget regarding corrections and uh, the judiciary. And so um, hopefully we can get at those questions as we progress through this session. 
uh, it's important, I think, for the public to know not only what the problem is, but how we're going to fix it. So I'll uh, reserve my questions for a later time and uh, a little more detail uh, on some of these specific areas. Thank you, Senator Limmer. I'm going to pass to Senator Pappas so I can present my bill. Yeah, thank you very much, Commissioner, and everyone in the staff. And looks like you've got some great proposals moving forward. Um, next on our agenda is Senate File 133, uh, Senator Umu Verbaten. Labor trafficking provisions, and while they're coming to the table, I, I just want to take the opportunity to ask people to guess who was the first author of labor trafficking back in 2005. Get three guesses. Me, me, me. <laughs> Senator Umo Verbaden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, today I'm presenting Senate File 133. This bill was developed in consultation with Hennepin County Attorney's <coughs> Office and the Advocates for Human Rights with input from labor trafficking experts, including survivor leaders. The goal of the bill is to close gaps in our current law that leave uh, trafficking victims unprotected. The bill also enhances penalties for cases of labor trafficking involving children under age 18, trafficking that takes place for an extended period of time, or trafficking that results in great bodily harm or death. One uh, point to just clarify, this bill changes language from uh, blackmail to demonstrable reputational harm, just to better confirm with other state and federal laws, as well as to address the concerns of prosecutors. Um, the concept of blackmail is not being removed, it's just the language that's being changed. Uh, Susan Crum from uh, Hennepin County Attorney's Office, she's a senior assistant in the Complex Crimes Unit, will provide some more detail um, and explain the specific scenarios that this am amendment to the law is designed to address. And then Madel Madeline Lullman from the Advocates for Human Rights and Superintendent Drew Evans from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension will also testify in support of this legislation. Um, and then additionally, Kim Nelson from uh, the North Central States uh, Carpenters Union will be here to testify as well. So we'd like to move to um, the testifiers in a moment, but I do have an author's amendment. Uh, is that the A2 amendment, the author's amendment? Yes, okay. it's the A2 amendment. Then um, Senator Umu Verbaten moves the A2 amendment uh, as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, motion prevails. Thank Senator Vermo. Senator Umo Verbaten. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to um, invite Madeline Woolman up to testify. Welcome, and please introduce yourself for the committee and the tape. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Latz, Vice Chair. I'm over Baton and members of the committee. My name is Madeline Lohman. I am an associate program director with the Advocates for Human Rights. We're a nonprofit based in Minneapolis, celebrating our 40th year of existence this year. Um, and we do extensive work on human trafficking in the state of Minnesota uh, and on most recently a focus on labor trafficking. So just to uh, cover the heart of the matter, labor trafficking is when an individual uses some kind of control or manipulation to get labor worker services from their victim and the victim believes they're unable to leave or stop. Uh, the goal of this proposal is to bring clarity to what those actions are that the trafficker engages in to keep the victim under their control. We have interviewed people in every region of the state who have encountered labor trafficking victims in a wide array of industries, uh, ranging from agricultural workers brought on temporary visas who were forced to pay kickbacks to both their recruiter and the farmer employing them uh, under threat of 
um, having their mortgages foreclosed in their home country and being deported. We've also heard cases of US citizens, youth selling magazines door to door who end up trapped in the sales crew. One man shared a story of his niece who had to crawl out of a hotel room window in Chicago because the company had people staying in the hotel rooms with them, so she had to pretend to go to the bathroom and then crawl out of the window in order to escape. Um, we've also seen romantic relationships that uh, end in an abusive situation where one partner is forced to go to work um, no matter what their preference uh, under threat of serious physical violence. So this is not a metro area crime. This is something that we see um, in rural areas, suburbs, um, and urban areas. In 2017, this is the most recent biannual human trafficking report uh, from the um, OJP. Service providers in Minnesota identified 394 victims of labor trafficking. Law enforcement was investigating cases involving 21 victims. We believe that even though uh, 400 victims in a year seems significant, that this is actually an undercount of labor trafficking in Minnesota because almost no government agencies or non-governmental organizations routinely screen for labor trafficking. So these are the people who are found sort of incidentally in the course of people's other work. This bill provides important clarity and alignment for Minnesota law. So we passed our current labor trafficking law in 2005, um, but it is turns out to be difficult to use. There have been only three labor trafficking cases charged under this statute since it was adopted, and there has been only one conviction for a purely labor trafficking case. It is also sometimes used in sex trafficking to address debt bondage situations, but for purely labor trafficking cases, we have seen three charges and one conviction. This bill would address some of the shortcomings, making it difficult to use, removing confusing language around status and condition of a debtor. Um, I think Senator Umuva Betten talked about replacing blackmail with reputational harm, and then providing context to use or abuse of a legal process, a term that's otherwise undefined under Minnesota law. Uh, Susan Crum, I think, will be testifying next and is going to go into greater detail on how uh, the language in the bill has impacted her ability to prosecute these cases. However, this is not just about bringing clarity. It's also about bringing us into conformity with other states. We were one of the first states to pass human trafficking legislation, and so we did not have many models to draw on. This revision uses language and concepts found in other states to ensure we enjoy the full range of anti-trafficking provisions in Minnesota. So the bill uh, explicitly explains the kinds of harm experienced by trafficking victims that might involve bodily, psychological, economic, and reputational harm. 26 other states include similar specific examples of harm, including Alabama, Montana, Oklahoma, and New York, and the federal government. Um, the bill also creates three levels of seriousness for sentencing that reflect the harm experienced by the victim. Uh, as well as preserving special protections for minors. Other states, including Hawaii, Kentucky, Missouri, and Tennessee, also have enhanced penalties when victims suffer from serious harm. Uh, some concerns were raised that these changes might uh, inadvertently make the bill overbroad, and so we went and examined ways to make sure that this was specifically addressing the kinds of harm we see in labor trafficking. At the recommendation of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, we added the word demonstrable to economic and reputational harm. We also used language about um, this harm being something that would compel a reasonable person in the same circumstances and with the same experience. That language is directly from the federal statute uh, where they use it to specify harm. And then we uh, added a definition of psychological harm that comes from our uh, harassment statute um, that was drafted to address some uh, concerns about overbroadness when talking about psychological harm. Uh, so we thank you very much for considering this bill. Um, we also just want to say that uh, one of the reasons we worked so hard in responding to concerns about the breadth of the bill was to avoid potential overcriminalization. 
We always want to be vigilant to ensure that when we increase criminal penalties and expand the scope of criminal bills that we are not going to have a disparate racial impact. So we support protecting those most vulnerable to exploitation and trafficking through improving the statute, but also urge that you continue robust monitoring and oversight of the impact of the changes of this law. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Crum? Yes. Welcome Good afternoon, to the Chair Lance. Go ahead. Other members of the committee, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to provide background and analysis on the recommendations for amending the labor traffic criminal statute. These recommendations are informed by our experience prosecuting labor trafficking in Hennepin County and also the experience that I've gained over 35 years as a prosecutor. Uh, like Commissioner Jacobson, I also came back to public service after retiring um, and I'm doing part-time work for the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, specifically in the area of workplace justice because this is something we've become aware of as prosecutors as being a significant impact on our, our uh, community, individual members of the community and business. Um, as Madeline Lohman stated, there have been very few cases charged and prosecuted under the statute, which has been on the books for um, over 20 years. Um, two of the cases involved an uh, alternate charging theory of labor trafficking in addition to sex trafficking. Our experience in Hennepin County involved a trafficking uh, case that arose in 2017. Uh, a labor broker by the name of Ricardo Batris uh, was trafficking several workers. Uh, he, he trafficked these workers while providing work on several residential housing projects that were located across the metropolitan area. Uh, and we would, would know we, we prosecuted this in Hennepin County, but the acts that occurred in this offense occurred over multiple counties. Uh, the case was charged in 2018 and the defendant was convicted of labor trafficking and insurance fraud in 2019. We learned a lot from that case, and part of our learning was that the language of the statute was very difficult. It was very challenging to capture within that the reality of what labor traffickers do to control and exploit their victims, and hence our ability to hold those, those individuals accountable for their criminal acts is impacted. And although there are certainly instances in which victims can literally be chained up, locked in a room, or otherwise restrained, or physically assaulted, the reality is that the tools used by traffickers to exploit workers are much more subtle. Ricardo Batris was a labor trafficker who was employing largely undocumented workers in framing and sheetrock. He did not have mandatory workers' compensation insurance for those workers. He lacked safety equipment necessary for these workers who were oftentimes working at height. He did not pay standard wage. Certainly there were no benefits or health insurance, and there was no payroll taxes deducted from any paychecks, which impacts government. Multiple worker, workers were injured. He refused to allow them to have medical treatment. And in fact, one worker was so badly injured, uh, his colleagues took him to Hennepin County Medical Center uh, over Mr. Battress's protestations. Um, and then because there was no insurance, public money had to be used to be paid for his medical care. Sadly, this is an all too common practice in the construction industry misclassifying employees as independent contractors to avoid the expense of workers' compensation insurance. That the fact that they don't have to pay for that insurance means that unscrupulous employers can then underbid law-abiding businesses, which affects the whole industry. As Ms. Lohman mentioned, the, the proposal that we are supporting here today uh, clarifies language for the statute. And it also creates or expands upon the actual statutory sentencing scheme that we have for labor trafficking. 
As mentioned, uh, one of the issues is debt bondage. The language as, as it is, exists now from the drafting in 2005 implies that there's some sort of contractual relationship between the trafficker and the individual who's being trafficked, that there's some sort of formal agreement and a contract that seems to imply that this is a debt that's willingly entered into um, and the individual who owes the debt is voluntarily working to pay it back. That is not the reality of the debt bondage and labor trafficking. In our case, the State v. Battress case, um, individuals who were working for, uh, for the defendant had been put up in a house. He controlled their housing. He told them that to live in a particular place. When a number of the workers complained about the fact that he wasn't paying them, uh, a couple days later, there was an ICE raid on this house and a number of individuals were then arrested uh, and taken into custody. The victim um, in our case and one of the witnesses in the case were in custody, and the defendant told them that he, he had contacts with ICE, um, he was a volunteer for ICE, and that he would get them out. He would also hire an attorney from them. Um, and of course that didn't happen. Um, one of the individuals, well, he did bail him out, but no lawyer ever showed up. He expended no money to help him. But then he told the victim that now he had to work for him to pay that money off. As, noticed by, uh, as noted by Ms. Lohman, we are also making recommendations for, uh, for amending the definitions of the acts that are included within the terms forced or coerced labor or services. One of those specifically discusses the abuse or threatened abuse of the legal process. That is the threat to report someone's undocumented status to, uh, to law enforcement. We wanna make it clear that that includes not just criminal reports, but also civil. Uh, in addition, um, there is also some language there just to clarify what uh, immigration or government documents um, being held um, and under control by a trafficker include. No more powerful control could be exerted on a victim of labor trafficking than to make clear that the trafficker knows of their undocumented status. In this particular case, when the victim was injured um, on a job site, his back was fractured in multiple places. He required significant medical care as a result of that. And when he was asked to, at the hospital to report whether or not this offense was work-related, the trafficker told him, and he was acting as, an, as his interpreter, you can't tell him it was work-related, you have to tell him it was, it was just happened at my home, because if they find out you've been working, they're gonna deport you immediately, they will not care how badly injured you are, literally that he had a broken back. Uh, and this is, this sort of pressure is being uh, asserted on someone who has limited education, language skills, and someone whose housing is controlled by the trafficker. Moving on to the sentencing provisions. At present, there are two, uh, two specific um, issues for sentencing. Um, one involves when the victim is under 18 and the other is when the victim is an adult. When the, when the victim is a minor, it's a 20 year felony, if the victim is an adult, it is a 15-year-old, 15 15 year felony. There is no uh, gradation in there that reflects the wide range of injuries that a victim could suffer as a result of the trafficking. We are proposing in this instance to recognize that there could be a whole host of injuries um, that could be suffered by a victim as a result of trafficking. We are proposing that if that trafficking results in death, that the felony would be a 25-year felony. A 20-year felony would apply to cases involving great bodily harm when the victim is under 18 or trafficking that occurs over an extended period of time. All other instances would be a 15-year felony. And we would, uh, we would um, point out that the level of injury or the fact that something occurs over an extended period of time is consistent with other criminal statutes in Minnesota, such as assault, financial exploitation, or sex crimes. And lastly, we would point out that the, 
uh, labor trafficking in Minnesota is, has been unranked under the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines. We are recommending that this offense be ranked by the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines. This is a personal person crime with a financial motive. It involves, as Superintendent Evans pointed out, they're very complex investigations and prosecutions and therefore merit the attention from the Guidelines Commission. Uh, and under this framework, uh, the commission would also have, have some guidance depending on whether it's a 25, 20, or 15-year felony. Thank you, Chair Latz and members of the community uh, committee. Uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. And then we had uh, Superintendent Evans also on the testifier list for this. And then we'll go into questions and discussion. I'm going to note it's already 2.20. Um, I want to make sure we have adequate time to answer questions and, and address this bill. Um, so uh, we have the room until 2.45. Yes. So we, we can go until 2.45 if for some reason we're not able to complete the bill. I don't know if we will or not. Um, but if we don't, we'll pick it up as the first item on Wednesday's agenda. Superintendent Evans. Uh, Chair Latz, members of the committee, uh, my name is Drew Evans, Superintendent at the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. I'll be very brief. As we noted in our previous discussion, the BCA commands the Minnesota Human Trafficking Investigators Task Force. This bill, as proposed, uh, would clearly recognize the different activities that formulate trafficking in a very clear and concise manner. And the BCA supports this bill and thanks the uh, Senator for bringing it forward. This bill helps protect those vulnerable to this exploitation in our communities and protects those industries, as you've noted as well, who work so hard to ensure the safety of our workers in Minnesota receive the money that's due to them in these processes and treated fairly, and to ensure that the economic viability of our industries that work so hard to, um, to ensure these things remains strong. This past year, there was a partnership between the Minnesota Department of Health, the BCA, and the Advocates for Human Rights, as you've heard today, that highlighted in that process creating an investigative protocol for agencies to develop these really complex crimes as we've discussed already here today. And that was developed through the multidisciplinary team to create this framework on labor trafficking that they've referenced here previously to me. That team identified that this law should be clarified to create additional clarity as we pursue criminal investigations into these offenses and to ensure then that our prosecutors have the investigations and tools available under the law to prosecute these individuals. The BCA will continue to work with agencies and communities across the state and we thank everybody for bringing this bill and considering it forward as we think it really brings some clarity under the law and a very strong approach to labor trafficking across the state of Minnesota. Mr. Chair, and then Senator we just have, thank you, one more testifier, Kim Nelson from the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Ms. Nelson, welcome to the committee. Chair Latz, members of the committee, my name is Kim Nelson. I'm Assistant Political Director at the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. We represent over 12,000 construction workers in Minnesota. Our work is not limited to solely our membership, though. Uh, we do reach out to uh, some of the most vulnerable in the construction industry. Uh, we are at the forefront of countering wage theft in the construction industry, which is a business model that uh, has the potential to create an environment uh, for potential labor trafficking, sex trafficking, and more. Um, it, it is through that work uh, and also the recent prosecution of the Hennepin County uh, case that you uh, heard uh, Ms. Crum uh, reference uh, that um, we discovered that the state takes the definition of sex trafficking seriously, but the definition of labor trafficking is not as clear, which allows the definition to be interpreted differently uh, at the courts. Um, we strongly support Senate File 133 to bring it the definition of labor trafficking more in line with the federal definition. And furthermore, we also support uh, that the uh, crime of labor trafficking should be taken just as seriously as the crime of sex trafficking. 
Uh, we very much see a correlation kind of when we're gathering the stories from workers. And so I thank you for your time and I ask that you uh, support Senate File 133. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Uh, so, Senator Mover Baden, I've got some questions and if, if you can answer them, great. If, if any of the others that testified are in a better position, that's fine. They can come forward um, to answer the questions as well. I'm just trying to get my arms around this here because um, it's a substantial increase in seriousness um, of penalties associated with sort of new circumstances that would justify it. So for me, part of the question is, and I, and I guess I hinted at this earlier, but what is it about labor trafficking that makes this a more egregious offense than first degree, than murder, you know, causing the death of another um, by some means other than labor trafficking. I think that's a you, Susan. Chair Latz, may I respond to that? Yes, please. That's it would not be more serious than murder or murder in the first degree or murder in the second degree. The proposal here with a reference to murder one and murder two is to make sure that labor trafficking that results in death is not as serious as murder one and murder two. Um, and in fact, right now, the, you know, the offense of labor trafficking is unranked under the guidelines here. So there, we have not seen any individuals under the Minnesota criminal statute for labor trafficking uh, go to prison. Uh, for something that didn't also include a conviction for sex trafficking, which is ranked and does include prison commitments. Um, I assume the goal here is to be able to prosecute beyond just those narrower facts, because there are all these other instances you've identified that don't seem to be prosecutable because the statute doesn't uh, really enable that. So I, I support the goal. I, I, I wholly support the, the goal of this legislation. I just trying to get my arms around it and what exactly it means. So, so how does um, the 25-year uh, penalty for labor trafficking resulting um, in death differ from the non-first or second degree murder deaths? If someone's convicted, I don't have it at my fingertips, if, if someone's convicted of manslaughter, um, What's the penalty for that, and how would this compare to it? Um, the, the penalty under the guidelines for manslaughter, one, two, um, and kidnapping of a victim under 18 is a level eight. Okay, what, I'm sorry, I'm asking, I guess, the maximum, because that's what we're defining in the statute in the bill in front of us, right? Do you want to look that up, Susan? Yes, I, I, could I have a moment to look of that course. up, and sure. then we can maybe or address some other questions? answer for me at his yeah. fingertips. Mr. Backus. Um, Mr. Chair, members, if you're asking the stat max, say, for third degree murder and manslaughter, uh, third degree murder, it's 25 years. Uh, manslaughter in the first degree, it's 15 years. Uh, manslaughter in the second degree is 10 years. Okay, so um, let's, let's back up then. What's the definition of third degree murder, Mr. Backus? If, if the proposal here is to make the comparable statutory maximum, the third degree murder. Um, Mr. Chair, members, a third degree murder has two uh, paragraphs. The first paragraph A is uh, without intention to co without intending to cause the death of another, causing the death of another by per uh, perpetrating an act eminently dangerous to others and evincing a depraved mind without regard to human life. That's 25 years. The other one is without intent, again, to cause death, proximately causing the death of a person by directly or indirectly, indirectly uh, selling, giving away, bartering, et cetera, uh, Schedule One or Schedule Two control substances. So both of those would be a 25-year felony. Okay. So then, for, for me, the question is, is that comparable to what's being proposed here, death arising out of labor trafficking. So Chair Latz. Like your testimony, your input on that. Yes, Chair Latz, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we would agree with that because what we're envisioning here is a situation um, where an individual is being trafficked and during the, and during 
the work that they're completing as a result of that trafficking, they're killed. For example, in, in this particular instance, the wall fell on the victim in this case, and he died as a result of it, instead of merely sustaining great bodily harm. The trafficker in this instance didn't intend to kill the victim in the case, but as a result of the trafficking and, and that sort of criminal conduct, a victim died. Clearly, that's a more serious result than an individual who might have had a broken arm or might have suffered some other type of harm. Not as serious as death. Senator Umuvu Beton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I, I think um, our testifier, Kim Nelson, sort of spoke to the prevalence in the construction industry. But again, it, folks are being you know, coerced into doing this really unsafe, dangerous work where they could die. So um, I think you explained it very well in the scrub, but um, if you are, um, you know, forced to work in these really unsafe, you know, conditions, that could result in that bodily harm or death. So let me posit a, a, another analogy in the criminal abuse statute where you've got a caregiver for a vulnerable adult and where they they intend to produce physical pain or injury but instead it results in death that's a 15 year statutory maximum um, so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with proportionality here also frankly with the deterrent value of it um, but I've always been a believer that the likelihood of being caught is a greater deterrent than the statutory maximum penalty that they're facing. And, and Chair Latz, may I respond? Yes, please do. Thank you. Ms. Crump. Uh, uh, it is a really complicated statute, and I did want to point out the fact here that we're not just proving whether or not it was forced labor or services or whether um, or not there was debt bondage, but we also have to prove the trafficking element trafficking element of it. So we have to prove that the trafficker harbored, transported, et cetera, that they possessed this person for a particular purpose. So it's not just the forced labor surfaces aspect of it, but also that the trafficking was occurring. And then we would have to prove the resulting injury, whether it be death or great bodily harm or that the victim was under 18. Um, in the criminal, abuse portion of it one of the one of the challenges in that statute is you can have you can have certain things that a caretaker can do that could be viewed as potentially being beneficial to a victim for example you've restrained them in bad because you're afraid that they're going to get out and fall and break something so there could be instances where what might be viewed as being harmful is not so they want to make it clear under that statute that it's harmful Right. Although in the criminal abuse statute, you'd have to prove the intent to cause injury. Yes. Not unintentional, not restraint, which unintentionally causes injury. Right. Um, and I'm also, I mean, the first degree manslaughter, uh, causing the death while maliciously punishing a child. Mm -hmm. Clearly intentional punishment maliciously, mm -hmm. um, but that's also a 15 year statutory max. So I guess I'm, I'm uncertain about the, the uh, effectiveness of increasing the, the statutory max from 20 to 25 years. And I guess the comparable question would be the, going to 20 years on the other category uh, in here, the under 18 or extended period of time or causing great bodily harm. I mean, 20 years for causing great bodily harm Sounds like a long time to me. Um, but if we set that question, as I kind of struggle with that in my own mind, if we set that aside for a moment, um, maybe a little bit, uh, well, also in both of those sentencing provisions, the, the standard for linking the conduct to the result is arising out of and in the course of. Um, and so, uh, I'll refer you to line uh, 4.6 and 4.18 and 19. 
Yeah, so I think Ms. Crum talked about this a little bit, which is that language was specifically used because the criminal conduct at the heart is not inflicting an injury on the person. The criminal conduct is forcing them to, compelling them to work. And that compulsion very often is accompanied by a total disregard for the person's safety and well-being. They get no breaks, they get no water, they get no medical care, they get no safety equipment, they have to work with harsh chemicals, they're a youth who's working in dangerous industries, um, and that that total disregard for the person's safety uh, could cause death or great bodily injury. But the reason the death or great bodily injury occurred wasn't just because the employer was negligent. It's because the employer was compelling the person to perform this work and the person felt they could not refuse. That even though the worker might feel this is unsafe, my life is at risk, they can't refuse because that's what the trafficking is. The trafficker has created a system in which the person can't refuse. So, I mean, I'm familiar with this language in, say, the unemployment or workers' comp statute arising out of or in the course of. But mm -hmm. Are there any other criminal statutes where that kind of a causal connection is described that way, as opposed to saying caused by or resulting from, which is the language Ms. Crum used in her earlier testimony? Or is it, this seems like a little looser standard than I'm accustomed to seeing in criminal statutes, especially where you're looking at 15, 20, 25 years <coughs> in prison. Do you want to hear? May, may I respond, Chair Lads? Yeah, please. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, the, the language that we're proposing uh, states that the victim dies and the death arose out of and in the course of the labor trafficking or the laborer services related to the labor trafficking. So you could have an instance where someone's being trafficked and they're working and they happen, somebody comes up and shoots them and they're killed. That would not be out of the course of the labor or services that the individual is being trafficked for. So we as the prosecution would need to prove that death basically was caused or arose out of the laborer services that the individual is being forced um, or coerced into performing. So that's how we viewed that. There was some concern about that initial language, which is why um, the version um, that you're viewing now says, and murder one or murder two has not been also committed to avoid the Calvic issue we would have with there being a homicide potentially being labor trafficking as a lesser included offense. That's to make it clear that if there was a homicide, clearly an intentional homicide, uh, we would not be required to only be able to successfully prosecute a lesser included offense of labor trafficking. So I think the causal connection is the person died as a result of the trafficked services or labor. similar to the, the drug death cases, where an individual is prosecuted because they provided injurious drugs to an individual who then died as a result of that. The connection would have to be the person died as a result of an overdose and not as some other medical condition. So what is the language used in, in the statute that you just referred to? Is the, it saying the death resulted from? Or does it say? I think Mr. Bach has just had that statute. I don't know <laughs> if he's digging it up right now. I think it was the third degree murder, right? Mr. Bacchus. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, I, I, I think that is the third degree murder. Um, whoever, without intent to cause death, approximately causes the death of a human being by doing that stuff. So they uh, use know, the phrase proximately causes? It says proximately causes the death of a human being, yes. But it does say directly or di indirectly, um, unlawfully selling, giving away, bartering, et cetera. Okay. <clears throat> um, do we know, are, are there any other criminal statutes that use the language arising out of and in the course of? I, Ms. Crump? Yes, thank you, Chair Latz. If I recall, I believe criminal vehicular operation has similar language. 
we're going to ask council to look that up. I know Senator Kroon has a question, so I don't want to go to that while we're getting a little more information. Thank you. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm struggling kind of with the language here. I understand, I think I understand the intent. Um, and that is that when this labor trafficking is going on, it often results in unsafe working conditions. I think that's the underlying intent here. But I could also envision a scenario where someone is being trafficked, but the working conditions is, are perfectly safe. And I'm wondering if this language gets covers that too. So they're they're in a, a work, you know, something happens where they die, but it's not because the working conditions were inherently unsafe, but they were being trafficked. And would this 25 year kick in under that scenario? I think that we would need to demonstrate that the death uh, arose out of the trafficking and that there was a causal link in some way between the circumstances of the trafficking and the death. So, uh, you know, if they just get shot by a stranger, but the otherwise the working conditions were fine, then that wouldn't be a death arising out of the labor trafficking. Um, but I'm not sure what circumstance in which the person would die, but otherwise it was a safe workplace. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I can think of scenarios where there isn't anything inherently unsafe about, I mean, accidents happen all the time in, in construction sites and that thing. And it doesn't necessarily mean, outside of the context of labor trafficking, doesn't necessarily mean the employer's criminally responsible mm -hmm. because they did something wrong. It, it could be a freak accident. That is relating to the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. My question is if that kind of scenario happened, and, and you said you would have to prove a causal link. I'm just wondering if the language here requires that causal link or if we need to work on the language to get that causal link a little more specific in there. Um, I guess that's kind of just my general question on that or comment about how I see the language. Ms. Crum, did you yes, want to thank respond? You, Chair. Go ahead. Thank you for that question, Senator. Um, I. Um, we did have a lot of conversation about this, this actual question that you're inquiring about when we were drafting this language um, and felt that the fact that the death would have to arise out of the labor trafficking and the labor services being provided addressed this. For example, if you had an individual who was working, and, and, and I know that we see this within a civil context, you could have a worker who ignores all of the safety requirements doesn't wear the safety equipment that they have, and as a result of that, there's an uh, accident and the individual is killed. In that particular instance, I would not feel that this criminal statute would be something that we could use as a prosecutor because it wasn't caused by the labor trafficking and the labor services that were being forced or coerced. It was the action of the individual who was working and not following the rules that resulted in the death. But thank you for that question. <coughs> Senator Lemmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just some technical questions. Uh, why are we repealing blackmail in this bill? So this is Ms. the Holm. only place that blackmail appears uh, in Minnesota state statutes. It was specially defined in the labor trafficking statute in order to be incorporated. And since it's a term that has like no fixed meaning under Minnesota law, the definition of it right now is very similar to definitions in the coercion statute that the Minnesota State Supreme Court overturned. And so we wanted to use different language that was not going to repeat that problematic language. So we used reputational harm, which is also the term used in uh, the majority of other states on this issue. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator um, Lumber. Maybe I can ask counsel. Um, we don't have blackmail listed in any other area of law other than this particular one. Mr. Backus. Um, Mr. Chair, I've not done a search for that. I'm going to have to rely on the witness. I think they use theft by swindle for some of it and coercion for some of it, okay. uh, but not a term, not something termed blackmail. Okay. And, Mr. Chair, um, does the words that you have on 
lines 3.9 and 3.5, the term reputa reputational harm, is that in exchange of the word blackmail? Yes. Ms. Lohman. Yes, that and is. And Mr. Chair, is that, Senator Limmer. is that defined, reputational harm? Ms. Lohman, the, or Senator Limmer, the A2 amendment did add, flush did? that out a bit, just for your information. All right. <clears throat> Ms. Lohman, anything to add uh, to that? Just that the um, Minnesota County Attorneys Association specifically looked at that and felt that by saying demonstrable reputational harm, you were capturing the range of uh, actions that could harm someone's reputation, but that you would have to demonstrate actual meaningful harm, that it couldn't be hypothetical or, you know, their feelings were hurt. It had to be a, a actual damage to their reputation based on the actions of the trafficker. So, members, the A2 amendment uh, from lines 1.2 to 0.6 uh, specifically and of course, addresses the language there. Yeah. And if I may, Chair, Ms. also the, the um, in addition to demonstrable, the fact that it now says um, sufficiently serious under all the surrounding circumstances to compel a reasonable person of the same background and circumstances is also to make sure that we're really capturing significant, clear harm. Okay, so, Mr. Chairman, Senator Limmer, if passed, this would make the term blackmail more of a obsolete euphemism than any legal term. Senator Limmer, it sounds like it already is. I guess <laughs> it's so. just being removed from statute. Yeah. Because it All doesn't right. have much meaning now anyway. Okay. Senator Westman. Uh, uh, members, I do have an answer to the, uh, the criminal vehicular operation statute. It does say causes um, the result. Um, so I also have an, another question. On line 4.17, um, referring to uh, the enhanced penalty, if you will, over the default 15 years, the trafficking occurs over an extended period of time. What does extended period of time mean? May I respond to that, Chair? Ms. Crump. Yes, there, um, that is something that is um, up to the prosecution to prove at trial. Uh, that extended period of time also exists, I believe, in in child sexual abuse cases, it occurs in vulnerable adult abuse cases, um, and it there isn't like a period where it's you know six months or a year. We would have to prove that it was an extended period of time, um, and so that is not defined. Uh, there is case law, I believe, that that may address that under criminal appeals under those other statutes. Thank you. Ms. Crum, I, I guess I'd be interested in seeing what the case law says about <coughs> that. Um, Certainly. Because it sounds a little bit vague to me. Uh, as, as a sole basis for enhancing the penalty. Um, but I'd, I'd like to learn more. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, Uh, I, I guess I've also noticed that uh, Ms. Crum, well, actually, you and Ms. Lohman, as you describe the causal connection here, you keep using the term as a result of. Um, and if that's the intent, I guess I'm trying to figure out why that's that language itself is simply not used in the statute. Um, or the approximately causes directly or indirectly. The approximate cause has been around as a standard, in, certainly in, in civil law, mm -hmm. for centuries. Mm -hmm. um, every lawyer probably spent weeks on it in law school, <laughs> that very concept in tort class. So I guess I'm 
a little bit uncomfortable making a decision right now as to whether the language is tight enough in that regard. And I guess I'm still not quite comfortable yet with the the enhanced penalty uh, proposals. And honestly, I'd like to hear the committee's input on this too, but we're bumping up toward the end of our available time. I think our earlier presentation went a little bit longer than anticipated, and I apologize for that. Um, Senator Lemmer, am I the only one that's having these uh, Mr. Chairman, concerns, or, or Mr. is Chairman, it just more um, than just me? I, uh, maybe I just have a unique um, focus, but I think you're right on raising the question of proportionality. I don't know what, I don't have a suggestion of what should be the appropriate sentence, but um, maybe as we continue to study this, we'll come up with that answer. I just think that it might be just a, a hair too long when compared with other crimes that seem to be far uh, more serious. And so uh, I, think, I think you're going down the right path. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, of course, the part we're struggling with here is 15 years is the base statutory max, and when you're adding in these other components that seem to make the conduct more egregious, where do you go from 15? Yeah. Right? So I think that's kind of the conundrum we're in. Senator Kroon, and then we're going to have to... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, just you were wondering about input. I, I'm struggling with the language, too. I think there's a probably an amendment and a way to sure up the language to get at the intent. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't have anything in mind, but I am struggling with it too because it, it the uh, ar arose out of or in the course of labor and service related to the labor trafficking. To me, it, it, I'm not sure exactly what that means and I think the, the intent is to avoid a situation where, yeah, the trafficking put the person in that situation where they're working and yes, they died as a result of their work but there wasn't anything inherent in that actual work that was dangerous sufficient to lead to a 25 year. You know, that's what I'm struggling with. It seems like there's gotta be, it's gotta be a two step process. There's traffic that puts them in that situation and it's an inherently dangerous working condition. I think both of those elements should be present if we're talking about this enhanced penalty of 25 years. I don't think the language quite gets there, but I'm sure there is language that could get us there. I just don't have anything to offer right now. Mr. Chair. Senator so I know Senator Westland has a question, oh, but it, we back. would be comfortable moving forward with proximately causes language if council can point us in the right direction while Senator Westland asks her question. Uh, Senator Westland, and then I'm afraid we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to resolve that today. I'm, uh, but we'll, Senator Westland. So I have questions about actually about using that language. And I don't do criminal law, so I'm probably way out of my depth here. But... If you drive a car and you and someone dies, it's it's literally as a result of your car. Like you were driving the car, the car killed someone. And what I think I understood Ms. Crum to say earlier as part of the explanation is the act of labor trafficking itself is not causing the death. But what the labor trafficker <coughs> is doing is they are exerting complete control over an individual. Um, the, the person is not free to leave. They are taken a, advantage of and abused. And so it's not the labor trafficking itself that causes the harm or the death. And so when you say that it is harm that is arising out of or as a result of, to me that makes sense. Um, if you sell drugs to someone and they die from the sale of the drugs, it was the drug and the actual selling the drugs that killed the person but it's not the act of trafficking someone that's killing them. So I, I, I guess I, I don't know what the answer to this is, but it makes sense to me. My plain language reading and my English degree <laughs> tell me that this makes sense. And so I'm not sure if proximate cause is quite right either, um, but I'm not a criminal attorney, and, and but those are the things I'm struggling with. I actually think for me as someone reading the plain language of the statute, it makes sense the way it's drafted. And one other thing to, to sort of think about is, you know, if, if you're the one who recruited the 
laborer, the trafficked individual, and you're no longer involved, and you're three years down the road, um, are you somehow responsible as the recruiter for a death arising out of or in the course of that trafficked labor? Um, so I guess we're all struggling a little bit with some of this. Um, it is five to three. Um, it's a worthy discussion, I think, that we need to kind of sort out. Um, but we have staff and members have to be at three o'clock committees as well. Uh, so um, we're going to take this up first thing on Wednesday. I surprised my committee administrator when I said that earlier. Uh, the Department of Corrections will have to understand because um, I don't want this to be dragged on. But I think we need to spend a little more committee time make sure we're comfortable uh, with this. Um, and uh, so uh, thank you, members. Uh, we're going to lay uh, Senate file 133 on the table. Um, and uh, it'll be first on the agenda on Wednesday. Um, and uh, for now, we are adjourned.